1998 when I first read about space adventures on a British Airways flight, and I found out that people could go to space and could go to the International Space Station, I was so jealous. And I thought, how did this happen? Why did I not know about this? This is something I've always wanted to do. So I started looking into it, and it's really expensive. And it helps if you are famous, which I wasn't. So <laughs> I haven't done that yet. But I never thought that in the 15 years since then, I would find so many other fascinating things to do and have so much fun. So I want to share with you some of the things I've been able to do along the way, because you can do them too, and tell you, you'll see that things are ramping up, and there's more and more that we can do every year, and it's getting more and more available. So this is uh, Space Adventures' current website. When I read about it in 98, that's what they offered, go to ISS. And to do that, it cost about $15 million, and you had to go spend nine months learning Russian and training as a cosmonaut, because what you were really doing was buying your way into the Soviet space program. And people have done that. People have done it. <coughs> Not me yet. Um, since then, what they've added now, for I think it's about $100 million, you can go around the moon. Nobody's done that yet. I've heard that one ticket is sold. We're waiting for somebody to buy the second when they have both passengers. That will happen. Um, the orbital space flight is going to ISS. And suborbital space flight is what I'm particularly interested in because there are a lot of companies, and you've probably heard of some of them, Virgin Galactic, x -Core, that are coming online very soon, very close, um, either doing their test flights now or getting close to that point. And that's where we hope to be able to begin to get a lot more space than we've had today. This picture in the lower um, left, as you look at it, if you look close, you'll see that that's a dual fuselage, gigantic plane. That's me in the brown t-shirt in front of it, looking pretty small. That is Virgin Galactic's White Knight 2. The spaceship is not hanging there in the center, because this is after the drop test that we saw at Mojave last summer, two summers ago now. It was 2012. You can see the little Mojave logo on the airplane stairs there. And what we saw was this amazing airplane with its spaceship come zooming down the runway, take off, and drop that spaceship, which is a glider, like the space shuttle was, and it glided back down to Earth, and then the plane landed. Since then, they've done the firing test, where they've actually fired the rocket engines on that spaceship. The plane takes it to the upper atmosphere. It fires from there, <coughs> so it's safer and less environmentally damaging than uh, traditional rockets. And that's me on the right when I got to go on a zero-gravity flight, which is the spaciest thing I've done so far. It's not space, but it feels like it. OK. So um, yeah, in 2012, I began to be able to take teachers along to do some pretty amazing things. In the upper left corner, this is at <coughs> CAMI, the Civil Aeronautic Medical Institute in Oklahoma City. It's uh, part of the FAA facilities there. And it's originally for pilot testing. But it's also useful for people to learn about astronautics and what they might expect in space. What we're doing here, we're divided into two rows. You can't see the row that's facing us. But you can see people have oxygen masks on. This is a hypobaric chamber, meaning that both oxygen and pressure can be removed from this chamber so that we can have the experience of going to a very high altitude and then losing pressure, losing air. And it's an important part of training to understand for yourself how you feel when that happens. We had monitors on our fingers showing us what our blood oxygen level was and our pulse, and also to be able to track your partners and teammates, because everybody reacts differently to this. Um, Rick Sirfoss is in the back of this glider. He is a former space shuttle commander. He's now head of test pilots for x -Corps Aerospace in the Mojave. And that's a teacher in front of him. Every year as part of our flight experiments workshop, we take teachers on glider lessons, and if they're up for it, let them fly a little bit. It's the best way to understand how lift really works. We took a tour of SpaceX. We went inside their facility. We saw it's so cool, because it's such a small company. And this also was two years ago. They're in Hawthorne, California. Falcon rockets, Dragon capsules, the one that had been up and come back. There had only been one so far at that time, you know, with its atmospheric burn. And um, here's the lunchroom. And here's the command mission control. So it was just amazing. And we got to talk to the engineers and to Gwen Shotwell, who's the president of SpaceX. Um, on the lower left, that is a Zeppelin. 
It was called Airship Ventures. We flew on the last flight of that. Unfortunately, that went bankrupt. That was in Silicon Valley at NASA Ames, and they were reliant on advertising, and they just couldn't get enough advertising to uh, keep themselves flying. Um, in the middle is one of our teachers working on a balloon launch, and that's what I really want to talk to you about today if I haven't run out of time yet. And then um, we talked about the Virgin thing. Okay, so virtual space experiences. What if you want to get the feeling of going to space? How can you get started? You're not that far from New York City. You've probably already done this. You go to Museum of Natural History. You go to the Hayden Planetarium. And on Tuesday nights, at least once a month, they do this astronomy live where you can get your hands on that software that they use to drill up and down through the virtual universe, which is super amazing. And if you get to know Carter Emmert, who runs their digital universe and has spent his life's work building that, um, he can, he's available for private shows. He can do all kinds of amazing things and help you with your research. And you can really explore the universe digitally. Um, for you know about $100, you can have this gliding experience or go skydiving. So you get the feel, find out for yourself, is space really something you want to do? How, how well do you handle extreme experiences? Um, $250, NASTAR is in Pennsylvania. This is the price for their camp. So this would be for students, and they have different levels depending on the age of high school and middle school, and I think there's even one for elementary. So they can have some astronaut training in Pennsylvania. For about $2,400, there are uh, more and more com companies around the country, you don't have to go to Russia anymore, that offer jet flights. And one of them is the Starfighters in Florida, but there's also some around New York and Texas, California, you know, typically where people are interested in space. So you can look on that website and find out where to go in a jet fighter and get in the upper atmosphere. And then parabolic flights, zero G. The retail price is about $5,000, but keep your eyes open. I got mine at a um, fundraiser for the Explorers Club where Richard Garriott, who's one of the guys who has flown with Space Adventures to the International Space Station, he wants people to go to space, donated um, zero G flights, and I was able to get two of them on the silent auction for $4,000, so that was a pretty good deal. And the friend that went with me will probably be my friend forever. <laughs> Okay, so what are we doing today? Um, balloon launches is the number one thing we're doing. You might say, oh, it's not very spacey. It doesn't sound very exciting. But the balloon, if you fill it with hydrogen, which is cheaper, a little more combustible, so be very careful, but it will, you know, because it's volatile, it will take that balloon up to about 110,000 feet before it bursts. So your camera is going to get pictures like this, which is super exciting for the students. You can put all kinds of data sensors packed in to your payload and you connect them with cables and you have a parachute so when the balloon bursts your payload parachutes back down to earth and if you have good tracking software and have chosen your location and used your projection of your path chances are you'll be able to retrieve it and get some results so GoPro video and still camera GPS and transmitter so you can track the thing because uh, it can go pretty far it's about a two-hour flight on a windy day it can really cover some distance um, an accelerometer, Geiger counter, check your radiation, temperature, altitude, atmospheric pressure, all these things are worth tracking, especially if you're doing repeated launches or multiple balloons simultaneously. Great way for students to see what kind of story they can tell. What do they learn by comparing the readouts? Can they find the story of what happened to this balloon? Um, and if you want some planning guidance, Quest for Stars, this is Bobby Russell. He is working with us now. I met him at a education, science education conference in Houston a couple years ago, and he has a lot of experience running balloon launches. Um, Embry-Riddle Aeronautical University is a partner of ours, and they're in Florida. They have posted some really good advice to tell you exactly how, what, da what data sensors to use, how to pack it. And then Columbus Space, this is Columbus, Georgia. That's Luther Richardson. He's another record holder in balloon launches who works with us every year. You want some software for tracking and retrieval. This, you can see this flight path. What we did here, um, we put the data sensors on the teachers, and I wore, this is mine, when we did the glider flights so that we could have experience and get familiar with how it worked. And then the next day, when we did the balloon launches, it was more meaningful. 
So um, no glider flies like this with these sharp angles. What's going on is that the data points are being sent periodically, and so you're going to get not a perfect representation of your flight path, but a pretty good one. And then once you get your data sensors back, you can do all kinds of analysis and see what can be learned. Gloves, um, blanket, there's a team here holding this balloon up as it fills. They're fragile, and you don't want to lose it. You've only got the one, maybe you have three, but you don't want to lose them. Um, some of the data sensors in payload, and you want to really mark it and make it look professional and have information for how people can find you in case somehow you do lose it, it goes in a tree or the water, because you want to get it back. We did one balloon two years ago, two balloons last year. This year we're going to do three. We keep finding ways to get more, and that's going to be really exciting to have three different balloons going up at about the same time. This was in Mojave, California. We tracked it, it came down in the desert, we found it. There's the parachute and the cross that connects the parachute cables to the payload, which you can kind of see off to the left there. Okay, it was a hard landing. Despite the parachute, this particular payload broke open, and this can happen, and you lose a data sensor or two, so we're gonna have to go back and look at what happened with that one. That's the first one that we've had break. We still got a lot of good data, but we lost a little. Okay, so what if you want some experiences? This is us, teachers in space, and we provide stuff specifically for U.S. high school teachers, but you can look on our website and find information and inter interact with us even if you're not a high school teacher. Microcontrol programming. We start our workshop with Arduino programming, um, which is very useful. Microsensors, microcontrollers for the sensors so you can build your own, and there's a lot of information if you haven't done that yet. CubeSats are the thing that we can begin to pack our sensors into. They're better designed and won't break open, and they can be loaded. They're standard packaging that can be loaded into the suborbital spacecraft when they're flying to ISS. So that's something we want to move to, and we're going to start doing that this summer. Um, suborbital research. There's a suborbital research, next generation suborbital researchers conference every year. The next one will be next January, and it's a great place to find out what kind of research is already being done so that you get ideas for what you want to build on. And then ISS experiments. I didn't include this when I made this presentation, but it has just happened. Last night, our, our first teacher and student designed experiment returned safely from ISS to Kazakhstan, 11.30 last night. And so we're very excited to find out what the results of that will be. This is NCESSE, the National Center for Earth and Space Science Education. And they have a program where for about $25,000, you can send an experiment to ISS, which is a laboratory. It's available for research, and it'll come back again. And they offer the program and the information on how to do that. How am I doing? Am I out of time? I don't know. Time's Done? Okay, thank you very much.